uh, uh, Brian Holzapple. He's our grants manager for uh, Team 2 for Neighborhood Revitalization. Uh, as we go along in the presentation, he's going to cover how to use the IntelliGrant system, which is our electronic application system. And so he's going to go over that uh, as well. And so we have a, a lot of good information. And also, uh, we're going to have a, a brief presentation from Melissa Archer. She's our preservation officer for neighborhood revitalization, and she'll talk about our Maryland historical trust process that some of these projects would have to go through as a requirement for funding. So we're about to pull up the presentation. Again, thank you for joining us. All right. So welcome again to the Neighborhood Revitalization State Revitalization Programs FY 2022 Program and Application Training. And so uh, in the Division of Neighborhood Revitalization, we're dedicated to working with uh, local partners to bring new investment and vitality to Maryland's uh, communities. And to do this, we offer a broad range of loan, grant, and technical assistance programs that help local governments, uh, nonprofit uh, development organizations, and small businesses to reinvest in communities and make Maryland a great place to live, work, and prosper. Um, in addition to uh, administering those programs, we also had uh, some programs that we managed within the Department of Housing and Community Development, uh, such as the Hope Foreclosure Prevention Program, which provides operating grants to 53 nonprofit housing counseling and legal service providers. Uh, we administered a Community Development Block Grant. Uh, which uh, provides federal grants to benefit low and moderate income communities. Uh, we also administer the uh, Community Services Black Grant, which provides operating grants to community action agencies. We administer the Emergency Solutions Grant, which is also federal funding that's matched by the state to assist homeless households. Uh, we provide funding for the Circuit Rider Program, which provides operating uh, grants for uh, small rural towns to, essential, uh, to assist with essential staff. Uh, we administer the rental allowance program, which uh, provides operating grants to provide rental assistance uh, for those who are homeless or at imminent risk. Uh, our Families First program, which provides grants to veterans uh, who are and their children who are homeless or at imminent risk uh, of homelessness. And the Community Investment Tax Credit, which is a competitive allocation of state income tax credits to donors to nonprofits in priority funding areas. Now, what you see before you on this slide is our FY 2022 state appropriations for our funding programs. And we're going to go through each program individually to kind of give you more information about what the individual program does. But for community legacy, we've been appropriated $6 million uh, in capital funding, and we're going to talk a little bit also on the next slide about the difference between capital and operating funds, how we define it. But uh, for uh, this uh, fiscal year coming, we have $6 million available with community legacy for capital uh, projects. For state uh, demolition funds statewide, we have $7 million with no money available for operating funds. For strategic demolition fund project core, we have $7 million specifically for capital funding. For Baltimore Regional Neighborhood Initiative, or what we call Bernie, we have $12 million in capital funds and $500,000 available in operating funds. For C, uh, Community Development Anchor Institution Fund, we have $10 million available for capital projects. And for National Capital Strategic Economic Development Fund, or NED, we have $7 million available for capital projects and $200,000 available for capital funding, um, excuse me, for operating funds. And so this is how we uh, break out the difference between what we consider capital and operating for capital. Uh, this goes for what uh, Kevin Baines would call sticks and bricks, land, structures, brick and mortar, something that has a 15 year shelf life. And you see some of the examples there that uh, are acceptable uses for capital funding. 
and then operating is cost that's associated with day-to-day -day operations of the program or the organization, such as staff salaries, feasibility or planning studies or marketing or maintenance. And so this is how we delineate between capital and operating. Now, uh, what um, entities are eligible to apply for these different pots of funding? So for community legacy, local governments and community development organizations are eligible to apply for community legacy funding. And we're going to give you some definitions in a minute. For strategic demolition fund, particularly Project Core, that is only eligible for Baltimore City. And so uh, local government agencies within Baltimore City or community development organizations within Baltimore City are eligible to apply. For statewide strategic demolition, again, local governments and community development organizations. For C, it would be hospitals or higher education institutions. And we define hospitals as a medical institution with five or more physicians and higher education institutions where they offer uh, certificates or degrees above the 12th grade. And for NED, local governments and community development organizations within the Capital Beltway corridor. And so we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about that as we go deeper into each pot or each uh, program funding. Here's just some basic definitions of those organizations, as I was just saying. Uh, we combine community development financial institutions with uh, community development organizations. These are organizations that are recognized by the IRS as a 501c3 community development organization with their focus and goals around community development. Uh, local governments and groups of local governments are self-explanatory. We already mentioned uh, how we define hospitals and higher education institutions. Next, I'm going to turn it over briefly to Olivia Ciccarelli. She's our assistant director, and she works specifically with sustainable communities. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see you all virtually. Yes. Um, just to reiterate what Garland was saying, all, almost all of our programs are required to um, have your projects be located within a sustainable community area. Um, and there's some, some exceptions that we'll go over in a moment. Um, but the designation process is a separate process where local governments um, create um, a target area that they're looking to um, invest funds into. Um, and it also comes along with a strategic action plan for the area. So if you go to the next slide, Ashley. Great. We have sustainable communities all across Maryland. Um, there's at least one in each county in Baltimore City. And um, there are, at this point, over 120 sustainable community areas. Um, so if you were to look on our website, at the neighborhood revitalization mapper. We do have a place for you to insert your address for the project and it will return back um, whether or not your project is within a sustainable community area and also if it's located within another target revitalization area such as an opportunity zone. And just to mention quickly, um, for some of you who have programs such as a commercial facade improvement program, there might not be an address that you know at the moment. However, you can insert a sample address, um, such as a business that exists already on your main street. And also, or um, if, if you have a project in a right of way, you know, maybe the closest address, just to give us um, a more solid sense of um, where you are looking to physically do that project. Fantastic. Thank you, Olivia. And so how uh, do you access our revitalization resources? And there are several uh, ways that you can access our resources. One, uh, you can be an eligible applicant, and we talked about uh, eligible applicants, or you can be a partner. Now, for instance, say like you are a for-profit developer. That would not make you eligible, uh, an eligible applicant for our funding, but you could partner 
with one of our eligible applicants on a development project. So you can partner with a local government, you can par partner with a community development organization. They would have to serve as the lead applicant, but you could be a partner within that application to access funds. Uh, number two, uh, propose a shovel-ready project. Our grant programs are highly competitive and they're usually oversubscribed at least by a three to one ratio. And so, and also we typically enter into two year uh, grant agreements or uh, uh, award agreements for our projects with awardees. And so we can only fund projects that are ready to spend money. And so this means that you already have site control and you have permitting in place or close to being in place for your project. And so we like to see that as soon as a project is awarded, that uh, the awardee is ready to spend money as soon as the uh, award is executed and ready to move forward. Three, does your project make a revitalization impact? Uh, we want to fund projects that are contributing to the revitalization of the community. And so that's very important. And so we are looking at what type of impact will this project make in the larger sense. And then leverage, leveraging other resources. We like to see other financial support contributing to a project, especially very big projects. And so we want to know that our funds are needed for the project, but we don't want to be the only stakeholder. Now, uh, through our years of funding revitalization work, we found that our revitalization dollars are most impactful when a place has what we call the three Ps, place, plan, and people. So when we're talking about place, we're talking about a target geographic area in which to invest funds. Uh, now, what is an area in need of revitalization? It could be an area that has experienced significant disinvestment where uh, buildings are crumbling, uh, and a local government wants to bring it back. Uh, it could be an area that is fairly healthy, but just needs funds to stabilize its local market because the property tax revenues really can't yet sustain the community. Or it could be an area at the tipping point. So revitalization works best when we target, for example, in a main street or in a specific neighborhood. For example, the town of Ocean City, uh, they did not want to designate the entire town as a sustainable uh, community designation. So they focus on the oldest section of the town initially. Uh, the town operates a residential and commercial facade improvement program and wanted to see an impact in the oldest sections first. So now that it has been targeting those funds in this area for years, it can visually see an impact uh, because 30 plus facades have been improved. They are now considering expanding their boundary to include the part of the town constructed after the 1940s. The second P is plan. The target area must have a plan for revitalization with goals, outcomes, and strategies for how to achieve those outcomes. And then the third P, people. There has to be strong local leadership supporting the plan with engaged community stakeholders ready to assist with implementation. Uh, there also has to be partners. And so, um, what part do these partners play or is the local government just acting as a lead agency in the sense of a pass-through where they're receiving the funds and they are dispersing those funds to partners how does the partnership and the people plan work together so these things are very important when we're talking about accessing the revitalization resources now i'm going to turn it over to ashley green and she's going to go through talking about uh, each funding area and uh, how, you know, the purpose of the program and who's out here. Good afternoon. The first program um, that I will go over is our Community Legacy Program. It's one of our most popular programs. The purpose is to preserve existing communities as places to live and conduct business to reduce outward pressures of sprawl development and promote sustainable communities. Uh, the eligible use of funds um, would be our capital expenditures only. The uh, eligible areas are our sustainable community areas as well as opportunity zones in Allegheny, Garrett, Somerset, and Wicomico counties. 
Eligible applicants include local governments and nonprofit community development organizations. The next program is our Baltimore Regional Neighborhood Initiative Program, or BERNI. The purpose of the program is to increase the competitiveness of, targeted, of the target communities for new home ownership and private sector business, residential, and commercial investment. Uh, it's also to demonstrate uh, a strategic as well as innovative approach to local housing and economic development that can lead to healthy, sustainable communities with a growing tax base and enhanced quality of life, and to accelerate achievement of healthy residential markets and economic growth in targeted communities through strategic neighborhood plans. Uh, for Bernie, we do have capital as well as operating funds available. The eligible applicants are community development corporations in Baltimore City or the inner beltway communities of Baltimore County or Anne Arundel County. Uh, you must be implementing a clear revitalization strategy in a specific neighborhood or set of neighborhoods and have cross-jurisdictional partnerships and partnerships with community development financial institutions are eligible as well as, as, well as highly encouraged. Um, our neighborhood, um, we require a neighborhood plan, which includes housing, economic development, transportation, natural resources, quality of life, as well as community engagement. And this not just shows the uh, current burning partners that we have, as well as their location. So if you're looking to do a project within one of these areas, uh, please refer to this map and reach out uh, to those organizations. The next one uh, is our strategic demolition fund for statewide. Uh, the purpose of the program is to accelerate economic development and job production, improve the economic viability of Greenfield development, which often faces more barriers than sprawling Greenfield development, and our eligible use of funds are what we call pre-development expenditures. So that includes demolition, site acquisition and assembly, site development, public infrastructure improvements, construction level designs, as well as stabilization. Uh, the eligible areas are our sustainable communities, as well as opportunity zones in Allegheny, Garrett, Somerset, and Wakamaku counties. And our eligible applicants are our local governments and nonprofit community development organizations. Our next program uh, is the Strategic Demolition Fund, uh, primarily for the Baltimore City area. It's called Project Core. The purpose is to eliminate blight in Baltimore City and support development of green space, new affordable and mixed use housing, and opportunities for businesses to innovate and grow. The eligible use of funds um, also include acquisition, demolition or deconstruction, stabilization, site development, and architecture and engineering designs. Uh, eligible areas are the designated sustainable communities in Baltimore City, and eligible applicants include city of Baltimore agencies, nonprofit and nonprofit community development organizations in Baltimore City. Um, some considerations for Project CORE include uh, proximity to 21st century schools, anchor institutions, transit-oriented development, Baltimore City network plan, reuse of landmark historic buildings, projects that build upon and expand residential market strengths, for instance, a home ownership program in designated historic districts, creating workforce development and job opportunities for Baltimore City residents, especially those with barriers to employment, as well as projects aligned with investments being made in opportunity zones. Uh, the budget requirements for Project Core um, are that applicants must provide evidence of a matching fund that requires $1 
in non-state fund funding for every four dollars in state funding that can include money from the federal government local government real property in-kind contributions funds expended before the date that the grant or loan is awarded but directly related to the project our next program is one of our newer programs it's the uh, Seed Community Development Anchor Institution Fund. The purpose is to provide matching financial assistance through grants and loans to anchor institutions to support local community development projects. El eligible use of funds include capital costs at, such as construction, rehabilitation, acquisition, architecture and engineering drawings, site development, public infrastructure improvements and other costs associated with capital neighborhood improvement projects. Eligible areas um, include that the project must be in a blighted area and support the improvement of a neighborhood that surrounds an anchor institution. Uh, these projects do not need to be located within a sustainable community, but if it is, it would be giving um, priority consideration. And if you are unaware of the de definition of blight or want to um, make sure your project fits that definition, please contact your project manager. The eligible applicants are Maryland Hospitals and Maryland Higher Education <coughs> The next project is the National Capital Strategic Economic De Development Fund. Um, it is the project uh, or program that I am primarily responsible for. Um, <coughs> the purpose of the program includes providing competitive funds for strategic investment in local housing, local housing and businesses to encourage healthy, sustainable communities with a growing tax base and enhance quality of life. The eligible use of funds include uh, those supported goals and objectives outlined outlined in the target area sustainable community action plan uh, as well as capital costs and operating costs uh, the eligible area is listed here it includes, <laughs> it includes projects in the sustainable community located in prince george's county at least in part within the boundary created by i-495 in the state and the District of Columbia and in Montgomery County within the enterprise zone or boundary created by Prince George's County, Maryland Route 200, Interstate 270, Interstate 495 to the Maryland State Line and the District of Columbia. Our eligible applicants for that program is local government and community develop, development organizations. If you are unclear whether or not your project fits this boundary, uh, feel free to reach out to me at the contact information that will be provided at the end of this presentation. All right, thank you, Ashley. I would like to ask, please, that you please mute your mics again, and also we can just make sure that we are, you know, uh, cutting down the feedback, and uh, hopefully whoever was coughing, you got some water. And so hopefully you feel better. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't ignore it. I'm sorry. All right. And so uh, hopefully everybody's here. All right. And so uh, let's give you a couple of uh, property examples. Just wanted to kind of give you an idea of some things that we funded uh, across these different funding sources. And so uh, in the city of Emmitsburg, we provided funding during the uh, FY19 fiscal year uh, to support the construction of a new ADA compliant playground. Uh, onto an existing playground site. And they were awarded $75,000 along with additional leverage of funds. The total project cost was a little over $300,000 and this helped improve the quality of life in community centers uh, because there had been no prior ADA compliant uh, structures, playground structures within eight miles of the town. In the town of Oxford, uh, we provided FY19 uh, funding for the uh, rehab of a 130-year-old mixed-use building known as the Muse and the uh, uh, Historic Commercial District in Oxford. Uh, we provided a funding amount of $175,000 along with additional leverage of uh, other funds. The total project cost came to 
a little over seven hundred and ninety six thousand dollars and so it completely stabilized the uh, building as you can see in the picture uh, and the Bernie area uh, this is something that is a uh, a Bernie program that we have uh, funded in the Southeast Community Development Corporation they uh, facilitate a neighborhood uh, spruce up program and it provides grants to uh, local neighborhoods uh, of approximately ten to twenty thousand dollars for public space improvement. And so we awarded uh, one hundred and seventy five thousand dollars and this was used to beautify lots, uh, do mural paintings and it also uh, had an impact of uh, spawning other uh, development in the area as well. Uh, in the town of Edmondson, uh, we uh, provided for FY20, uh, provided $50,000 for the continuation of an exterior beautification improvement program to bring homes up to current code standards. Uh, this is something also that we have funded across different funding sources. This one through NED. Uh, sometimes you have uh, home, older homeowners that may not have funds to do outside improvement on a home. And so the town of Edison uh, facilitated a repair program and leveraging some of our money to bring up uh, over 10 properties up to code and beautify the town by targeting dilapidated housing. And for C, uh, we are awarded uh, FY20 funding to Sinai Hospital for the construction of a new facility that's going to house multiple partner agencies responsible for a variety of violence prevention and intervention programs uh, right on Preakness Way, right next to the racetrack. Okay, with that, we're going to go into our application process and I'm going to turn it over to Larry Brown. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Larry Brown. I'm the assistant director for the Baltimore region, and I also am the project manager for Northwest Baltimore and Baltimore County. Um, I'm going to actually go over the application process. Um, the first step is threshold requirements. Um, for, for all of our current awardees, uh, you're required to be in compliance with terms and conditions of your current award agreement. Uh, so it's, it's critical for all current awardees to make sure that you're in good standing with all of your reporting requirements, including quarterly reports, final reports, and expense summaries um, for your prior awards. So if you have any questions about your status, if you are current with all of your uh, reporting requirements, if you have provided all of the evidence needed for your request for payment, uh, please feel free to contact your project manager to discuss. The next thing is uh, mandatory online submission of applications. So all of our applications are required to be submitted electronically um, for our FY22 um, um, SRP applications. Um, the, the link below is actually the link for our DCD uh, project portal. Um, on this portal, you'll be able to gain access uh, to our various SRP state revitalization program applications. Um, if you are a new user um, or new applicant, um, you will still go to this link below and click on new user. Once you click on that, your request to be um, reviewed and approved to gain access to our project portal. Um, and you should be able to get notification within 48 hours so you can gain access. Um, but for all returning applicants, um, you should already have your account in the system, so you won't have to request it to become a new user. Um, however, if you um, forgot your username or your password, um, feel free to reach out to your project manager in your, in your designated area, and they can assist you with that. Optional attachments for legal exhibits. Um, Prior, a couple of years ago, it used to be a requirement to have local um, support resolutions submitted with your applications. However, we, the state now, uh, will notify the local jurisdiction of your intent and request support on your behalf. So this is no longer a required step, uh, uh, step required by the applicant. Um, for Bernie applicants, you no longer need to obtain local government resolutions or letters of support either. So again, we, the state, will um, package and provide a, a list of all the, the intent projects and request support for the local uh, resolution support. 
Um, however, some of the required attachments for legal exhibits are the corporate resolutions. So for all of our nonprofit um, uh, community development corporations, you're required to actually um, provide a signed, executed copy of your corporate resolution, um, provide an access uh, to apply for our state revitalization programs. In addition to that, all applicants must have a signed disclosure authorization form submitted with the application. And what that is, that's actually um, given author authorization or designating the individual to sign on behalf of the entity that's applying um, for this for this application or grant. And also will be the same person that will submit requests for payments as well as uh, call a report. And for the nonprofits, the same signer for the disclosure authorization also must be a designated signer on a corporate resume. Also, uh, all of the, the projects need to provide a sustainable community area map. Um, Olivia talked about it a little earlier. You can use our neighborhood revitalization mapper um, that can be found on our website to put in uh, your project uh, address to confirm that it is located in a sustainable community area. Um, other legal exhibits that are required are articles of incorporation, copies of your bylaws, your IRS tax exemption determination letter, um, evidence of a certificate of good standing. So when you're initially um, submitting your application, you don't have to uh, provide the certified copy of good standing, which costs money, which runs around like $43. Um, at the beginning, you can just actually go to the State Department of Assessment and Taxation and do a screenshot just to show that your, your organization is currently in good standing and upload a copy of that. However, you will be required to provide a certificate, uh, a certified copy of good standing um, within 30 days of your agreement being um, fully executed. In addition to that, you must provide a list of organizations, uh, your organizational board of directors, um, also, uh, uh, a copy of your operating budget for the current year, um, a copy of your most recent independent financial audit, um, as well as um, providing that you are registered as a Maryland charitable organization. Other supporting attachments. Um, evidence of site control. Um, again, you know, our funding rounds are uh, extremely competitive, so it's very important to provide um, evidence to show that your, your project is shovel ready. So that's that's something critical. So if you have evidence of site control, um, a copy of your HUD-1 will be great. If you're asking for funds to help to acquire a building or, or, or a site, um, you can provide a copy of um, a contract of sale or a letter of the interest. Um, some type of uh, uh, documentation to show that you are in discussion and if you're able to be awarded these funds, you have the ability to proceed with uh, site control. Uh, documents, documentation of a funding commitment. Again, Garland talked about the importance of, of having our funds leveraged. So if you actually have um, award letters, um, copies of, 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 of checks that you uh, received from other funding sources, um, you know, whether it be bond bills, uh, other foundations that are committing funds to you. Um, if you have loans that you actually uh, are already been approved for, any documentation of funding that you already have committed uh, will only help to strengthen your application. However, if you also have um, a request pending, um, any uh, evidence that you can provide for is that that will be helpful as well. Thirdly, uh, cost estimate. Um, this is critical because again, if you're asking for a specific dollar amount um, for your projects, it's important to have some type of justification um, on how do you come up with this dollar figure. So um, invoices, cost estimates, quotes, things of that nature will only help to strengthen your application because we want to be able to um, see that the numbers are real and it's not just numbers that you pulled out of the sky, so to speak. Um, program guidelines. Uh, we have a lot of applicants that um, apply for facade improvement programs or even programs such as down payment and closing cost assistance. Um, so to be able to provide um, copies of your program guidelines are crucial because it shows that 
um, you actually uh, are pretty much shovel ready, that you actually have the, the guidelines in place. So if you have the money, you can simply go into implement, implementation mode after you begin the, the marketing um, and screening process. Uh, we talked about sustainable communities already and being in a priority funded area. So again, make sure that you, uh, once you go into um, the mapper uh, link and you put in your address, you pretty much just screenshot to show that the address of your designated um, project or program is located in a, in a sustainable communities um, area. Memorandum of understanding. This is crucial, especially when we talk about evidence of site control. Uh, again, Garland talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, we have a lot of developers um, that are interested in our, our funding sources to help to leverage um, major and big time development, um, but they're not eligible directly themselves. However, a lot of these for-profit developers do partner with eligible entities such as local governments, as well as uh, nonprofit community development corporations. But we also will need to provide, you will have to provide some type of uh, evidence of legal nexus, which is an MOU showing the relationship between the applicant as well as the for-profit developer who might own the, the, the site control um, that the, pro the project or program will be built upon. So MOUs are, are, are crucial and critical um, for your application. Lastly, um, uh, public relations materials. So again, if you have any flyers, marketing materials, we talked about uh, program guidelines, anything that you can actually show that, um, that, that, that provide uh, the reviewers that, that the program is in place and ready to go will only help your chances of getting funded. Um, other supporting attachments, uh, photographs. Again, photos can speak a thousand words. So it's crucial that you take good quality uh, photos of the interior and exterior of your project, uh, if it's a rehab, um, proposed rehab uh, program or project, so to speak, to show what it currently looks like um, is it, crucial, uh, as well as if it's just a, 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 a ready site that you would like to develop on, you know, providing photos of that um, is, is important as well. Construction, construction or renovation projects. So if you have construction drawings, if you already begin, begin the process for Maryland Historical Trust Review, um, providing copies of those documentations um, are, are important. Also, if your project will exceed the amount of $250,000, um, it's a requirement that you actually uh, deal with a minority business enterprise plan. So make sure that you actually uh, provide support to show that you're actually um, meeting those qualifications of MBE plan. Now I'm going to take a moment and um, allow my co-worker, Melissa Archer, to introduce herself and tell you a little bit more about the Maryland Historical Trust Review. Melissa, you're there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. My name is Melissa Archer, and I am the Historic Preservation Officer for the Department of Housing and Community Development. My role here is to help coordinate and facilitate our review of projects with the Maryland Historical Trust. And for those of you who aren't aware, um, we abbreviate MHT is what they're um, known, known as, MHT, and it's the State Historic Preservation Office. And they're another state agency that we partner with, and we are required as a state agency to consult with them on all of our capital projects. And so there are some projects that are exempt from review, including operating, so all your operating grants, um, that doesn't involve historic building, doesn't require review. In addition, we do not have to consult on architectural and engineering. So any projects, pre-development work that is exclusively A&E doesn't have to be submitted for review. But other than that, all other capital projects, we have to take a look and identify if historic properties are going to be impacted by the project. And if so, to what extent we can avoid, minimize, or mitigate any harm to those cultural resources. And so as a historic preservation officer, my job is to take a look at projects. Um, during the grant review process, I review all the projects to try to identify uh, if the projects involve historic properties or not and, you know, what the outcome, what the scope of work will be. Uh, so in your application, there will be sections where you can identify if your property impacts any known cultural resources. There's a section that you can identify if 
the property is located in a historic district. And so if you know that information, it's really helpful for you to include it there. And then also there's a section in the application that has a space where you can upload um, existing MHT reviews if they were already completed. And so this section is relevant if your project is a phase project and it has a previous review from prior fiscal year. So if you're on phase two or three and you have a you know prior review, um, that's a section where you can upload and document that uh, prior approval. Similarly, if your project has received federal funds or state funds from other programs and you've already gone through the MHT review process through these other entities, then that's a place where you can show us that you've already gone through those steps. Otherwise, don't feel any obligation to upload that section if you don't have an MHT review on file. And in fact, we advise you to not um, reach out to MHT. Please do not submit projects to them in advance of the application because that's what our role is. Specifically, my job is to coordinate that review. So I'll be looking at the applications and in determining if uh, MHT review is warranted and if so, when we should um, go through that process. So otherwise, some things to, to be aware of is that, again, it's required for all capital projects. We do the reviews prior to starting work and disbursement of funds. So if your project is imminent and you know that you're going to be breaking ground, perhaps even before the grant agreement or um, announcement of awards, let us know if there's any urgency because we can do the review sooner rather than later and prioritize certain projects. And then um, also, um, let me see. Mm. all right, I guess that's it. I covered everything. All right. Thanks, everyone. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Thank you, Melissa. Now, um, just some special considerations during the pandemic. Uh, as Larry mentioned, we want you to include as many high quality photographs as possible. Uh, because of the pandemic and uh, we, the state still has not lifted its travel restrictions for state employees, uh, we're going to try to address uh, our site visits and things like we did last um, fiscal year. Uh, if, if some of you previous awardees know that part of our process was coming out to personally visit projects and to meet with your development teams last year. For last fiscal year, we did not do that because of the pandemic. And so right now, uh, we've been kind of uh, thinking about how we would do it if we were allowed. Also, we would have to have the uh, the willingness from our um, teams as well of you know what they want to go out. And so right now, we're going to focus on virtual meetings and virtual site visits. We have access to Google Meet for video conferencing. And so, um, you know, right now we're going to initiate virtual meeting requests if needed to uh, meet with applicants to talk about uh, particular projects. Uh, if that does change, uh, we'll work with you to see if uh, in-person site visits would work. Uh, but, you know, right now we're approaching it as virtual meetings and virtual site visits. Right here is a list of the uh, partner agencies that participate with us in the review process. Usually several of those staffs are assigned to each region and they work with our staff lead on reviewing and scoring projects. So Maryland Historical Trust, uh, Department of the Environment, uh, Transportation, Planning, uh, Natural Resources and Commerce, as well as we do have staff from other uh, uh, divisions within the uh, Department of Housing and Community Development that participate as well. And so before we go into our final slides talking about the review process and uh, how we score, I wanted to uh, bring in Brian Holtzapple and uh, Brian's going to uh, spend some time going over the application submission process that you would take within the IntelliGrant system. And so uh, Brian, I turn it over to you. Okay, just a mic check. Is Garland, you can hear me fine? Yes, I can. Excellent. And I am going to present my screen.
And Garland, if you can just confirm when you can see Intelligrants. Yes, I can see your screen. Excellent. All righty. Uh, so I am logged into the project portal here already. And as uh, Larry had previously said uh, in the introduction, uh, applications are created and submitted through the DHCD project portal website. Uh, it is still operating on an older platform and I'll speak to this because we had some questions uh, in the earlier session. I'll speak to uh, upgrades and so forth coming in the future uh, at, at the end of this presentation. Uh, but for now, we are still operating on the existing system uh, at uh, projectportal.dhcd.state.md.us. And it does work best with an older browser. So it is recommended, if you can, uh, to use Microsoft Internet Explorer 11 uh, for 100% compatibility. Uh, newer browsers have presented uh, a few little quirky things, uh, mostly to do with uh, print version generation in PDF formats. Uh, but apart from that, it, you can get by with uh, starting, filling out, submitting the application with even newer browsers uh, without presenting any real difficulties. Uh, so again, if, if you experience any kind of technical issues in regards to logging into your uh, account, uh, resetting your password, or any particular access issues, uh, feel free to contact your project manager and uh, what they can't handle will get sent to one of our system admins. So uh, we will certainly be able to straighten you out. Uh, so when logged into the system uh, on your home page, you should see this section that says view available funding opportunities. Uh, and this is where you will see a listing of open applications. Uh, most of your organizations uh, are also eligible to other funding programs that are currently open, uh, such as operating assistance grants, uh, which is due right now until Friday, I believe, is the deadline for that one. So many of you may see this. Uh, you have two opportunities available. If you click on view opportunities, you will see a listing of the open applications. And sure enough here that Community Development and Services 22, which includes OAG, is currently open. So I'm gonna scroll past that one and look for state revitalization programs. This is the one we want, uh, which includes Bernie, CL, NCS, EDF, uh, NEDS, SEED, CORE, and SDF statewide. So to create a brand new application, we would click apply now. And that generates the new application record, which we can see here. And the status of this application we can see here, it says in process, not submitted. So this is a clean application, brand new. Uh, I I'm sort of jumped ahead on our earlier session, but I think I'm gonna pause here and advise on some of those organizational document requirements that Larry spoke of that are uh, requirements for the submission of an application and for threshold review and intake. A lot of those documents uh, relate to your organization, such as the W-9, the uh, uh, Articles of Incorpor Incorporation, bylaws, the nonprofit organization documents, and they are shared by every application that you create in the system they are stored on your organization profile. And there is a link for that at the uh, top of the page in the little gray banner here where it says my organizations. So even before you get started in the application proper, you might wanna review uh, the information that we have stored here in your profile, make sure everything is current, up to date. On page one, we have the general information about your organization. You can look over this stuff. Uh, this, the fields that are grayed out cannot be edited by you, but can be edited by our staff. Uh, and we do that so that the data stored here is consistent in its language as used by other state systems. But if you happen to spot some discrepancy here, uh, if, an, if a legal name has changed or a federal ID or something of that nature, and you need to have some of that data updated, uh, reach out to your project manager and we can follow through on any uh, formal requests for change that may be needed. The link that appears here, the third link in this purple set, the third page of this profile is called organization uploads. 
And this is the page that stores all of those organization related documents for nonprofits. So you will find here the current documents on, on file for W9, Articles of Incorporation, Bylaws, IRS Letter of Determination, uh, Board List, uh, an official certificate of good standing if you have a valid one currently stored. Um, charitable registration, Maryland charitable registration. Uh, this is one of the required docs. And your operating budget, current year, prior year, financial audit, most recent. So you can peruse these documents here and replace any that may need to be updated. These will be referenced again in the application proper. So it may be a good place to start to just assess uh, if any of these documents need to be updated for the new year. Now we're gonna to return to the application and since I left it and it's still sitting in process, the quickest way to get to an in-process application, one that you've started and have not completed, uh, either you know you had a step away and you came back tomorrow, what have you. The easiest way to find it is here on your home page under my tasks. If I open that window, I see I actually have two applications started, one from this morning session and one from the one I just created. But I'm going to go back to the one from this morning because I actually filled out some of that data and we'll just use that as an example. So to re-enter the application, click on the name link. And that will bring you back to the main page of the application. So we can see it's still in process, so it is still editable. I click View Forms. And this page gives you the menu for the application. At the top of the menu are some resource links. So we have a technical training document, PDF, uh, that sort of steps you through everything I'm going to be talking about here. So if you wanted to save that to your desktop uh, or print it as having as kind of a, a manual or a reference to, your, to the side, uh, that could be helpful. Uh, there's a link to the DHCD website to the SRP page where the guidelines, the program guidelines are stored, as well as these training presentations and additional program info. There is a sample application that you can print out if you wanted to see all the pages and all of the questions in their entirety. And this may be a, a, a nice piece to, to have at the ready, especially if you want to craft your narrative responses in say Microsoft Word and, and then later return to cut and paste the data back into the system. And then finally is the link to print the application forms. And these are the ones that you fill out. So when, when the application is all done and you want to generate a print version for yourself, that's the link you would want to click. And it's that link in particular that I speak of that it acts a little goofy with the, the newest browsers. So a Microsoft 11, uh, Internet Explorer 11 is your best option to generate that. Uh, but again, we could provide assistance if that's not um, something you have available to you. Let me get into the application forms themselves, beginning with the first page, application information. At the top of this page is the general organizational information. This is coming right off that profile that we already reviewed. Uh, so again, if any of this needs to be edited in some fashion, uh, you may want to reach out to your project manager for assistance. We ask if the address here stored is the same as your mailing address. If it is not and you would prefer correspondence be sent to a PO box or something to that effect, uh, you can say no and you can provide a separate different mailing address to us in this application. Next, we ask you for some contact information. Uh, first, the primary contact. So if anyone has any questions about the application contents, this is the person they should contact and reach out to. And then we also asked for an executive or elected official, and this would be the person to whom uh, an award would be addressed. Next, we have application details. So we will first select the program that we want to apply to. And one of the new questions this year is if you select Bernie, 
we also ask you to identify the Bernie area. So where, um, under which area would this project occur? And if you need any clarification on exactly what some of these mean or which territory uh, based on your address that this would be applied to, uh, your project manager can assist. You'll select if this is a program or a project. You'll select the type of program or project this is that best describes the application. So the list is relatively short and very generalized. Uh, so your, you know, the, the, the primary activity group category that this would fall into. Next, you'll create a project name and a project description. And this is just a short description, just an easy way to identify the project or distinguish it from others. Uh, just a limited 250 characters, about mm, two sentences. If this is an ongoing program or project, you can click that this is a phase, it's continuing. And then what type of funding are we requesting? I selected Bernie, so I do have options here. Uh, for every other program in the SRP category, they are capital only. And if you select anything other than capital for CL or SDF or core, it's going to throw you an error. But for Bernie, uh, we do accept operating requests or a combination of capital and operating. So in this example, I've selected both. And I've added in there how much capital and how much operating I'm requesting in this application. Uh, and I'm entering a total project cost, which would be the request value plus any additional funding that might be going into the project from the applicant or from other sources. Next, I'm going to enter a primary address. And this is address that should be mappable. Uh, so we provide links here to the DHCD Neighborhood Revitalization Mapper website. And what you can do is just type the address into this uh, mapper site and it will enlarge the map. It will show you what sustainable community it's in as well as some other designations. And what we will ask you to do is to provide the address that is capable of being mapped and to pr print this map as a PDF and attach it here. Next, you'll select the sustainable community. Again, that can be identified by the map. Uh, the results would show up here. And this list is sorted uh, alphabetically by county jurisdiction. So they should be relatively easy to locate. And then you will select which county or counties that the project uh, will be served, will serve. Following that, we have a list of various federal, state, and local designations, most of which also appear is, as uh, layers within that mapping tool. So if any of those or, uh, designations do appear to be within the area that the project is occurring, you can click the box and select specifically which district or designation it falls into. Or if it doesn't fall into any of those categories, we've got another here that you could fill out if you are aware of another state, local, or federal uh, designation. And, and barring any of that, we also have a none of the above option. So with the data all filled in on this page or periodically along the way, click the Save button. The Save button will always appear at the top of your browser window. Even as you scroll down, it will follow you down. But save early and save often because there's nothing worse than losing internet connection or stepping away for a minute and finding out that you're, you're or, or, or advancing to the next page and not saving and finding out that any that the data that you entered has been lost because it wasn't saved. 
Page two is additional addresses. So this page allows you to enter addresses beyond the single primary address that we used for the mapper. So the primary address that you entered on the first page carries over and you would not need to type it again. But if you have other addresses, say on the block or uh, scattered site, uh, you can enter those other addresses here and just fill in the details and hit save. The table will start with five rows, but as you start to fill them out and save them, it will continuously give you more. So you can add as many addresses as you have identified at this time. Moving on to the next page is the budget and financing page. And this is one of the pages with the questions therein is considered in the scoring of the application at 25 points. On this page, we'll be asking you to break out this request and show us exactly where the request amounts, what activities the request amounts are going to go to, and what other sources are being applied to the project. So at the very top here, we have carried over the request amounts and the total project cost that you entered on page one. And we just ask you to sort of break that out. Tell us how much of the capital or how much of the operating is going to what activity, what applicant amounts are being applied to the project, and what other source amounts. And in the event of other sources, we ask that you name the other source. The table will do the math for you as you enter values. And when you hit save, it will calculate against or to evaluate rather against what you had entered previously. So if there is a discrepancy between the request amount you put on one page and the details you entered here, uh, it will throw you an error. And so you'll have to correct either one or the other uh, so that they are consistent. We ask for what the total estimated completed cost when all phases of the project are complete would be. And then we get to the first narrative question, where it asks you to kind of give a more narrative description of the budget above. So you can here is where you can be more detailed in exactly what is uh, what the funding is going towards. Oop, before I get a little ahead of myself, I skipped the part. Speaking of uh, filling out this budget, if if perchance the funding doesn't fit into one of these first 10 designated categories, you feel like it just doesn't really fit these. Uh, there are four open other spaces that you can use to self-define the activity or use of fund category. And so these rows are available to you as well uh, to include in that math. So in particular, speaking of, you know, how does this budget break out? Uh, if you've said, you know, $50,000 request goes to admin, $150 match, or $150,000 match, uh, you can be more explicit as to what that goes towards. Uh, narrative questions are limited by character length. So, all of the narrative questions in the application are either 2,000 or 4,000 character limits. And that equates to approximately either one half or one full page of text typed into, say, Microsoft Word. So as you're drafting your narrative responses and trying to figure out if it's going to fit, a good rule of thumb is about half of a page is going to fit into a 2,000 character uh, field. And a, about a full page will fit into a 4,000 character field. Next, we ask if you're requesting what kind of financing. Is it a grant, a loan, or a combination? If you say you're requesting a grant and your request is $250,000 or greater, uh, you are asked to justify why a loan is not possible.
And next we ask what are the strategies to secure the funds needed to complete the project if the full request amount is not awarded. If you have shown that the total project cost includes other funding sources, uh, you will be given this section to respond and reply as to where these uh, other sources are coming from, what's the status, and also gives you the opportunity to provide evidence and attachments of those other sources and tell us what the status is. So, you know, if, if you're anticipating another award to come through, uh, it would be pending. Uh, and you could show, say, an award letter that you received uh, that you just haven't realized the funds from yet, uh, as opposed to confirmed, where you could show, um, you know, a, an award agreement or, or uh, evidence of payments or something to that effect. Other sources of funds, so these would be non-applicant sources. Other uh, grant awards, corporate, local, government financing, that sort of thing. And this here, similarly, you would provide a description of what those other sources are. And you can provide evidence of those other sources and the status of them pending or confirmed. These upload sections will start with three rows. So you can upload three documents, but on save, much like the address rows, as you save documents, more rows will appear for you. So you can upload as many as you have or as many as you need. Uh, one note about uploads in the system, there is a file size limit, not per file per se, but per page save and that limit is 25 megabyte. Very rarely are you gonna hit that limit, um, but if you're trying to upload, you know, six documents at once and some of them are photograph heavy or, or um, graphics heavy, they may be very large in file size. Uh, so you may wanna just check the file sizes of things before you upload them. Most PDFs are going to be in the teens to you know maybe a hundred or so, a couple hundred uh, kilobyte, well below the threshold. But again, when you get into something that is much thicker, uh, annual reports, perhaps something that might be graphics heavy, uh, you might want to check the file sizes before trying to upload multiple documents at the same time. And if you do run into a problem where for whatever reason you can't get the thing to upload, uh, contact your project manager for technical assistance. Next page is timeline and readiness. And here we just ask you to provide kind of a short timeline or schedule uh, for completing the project. The first line is always gonna start with the commencement date. And then we only give about 10, so you can kind of consolidate as to categorically what activities would occur between date ranges. And at the end, you know, what's the completion date? And you've told us now what you're gonna do. Uh, we ask then, what is your readiness to proceed with these activities? So describe the factors that are in place that, that evidence that it's ready to proceed and is shovel ready. The next page contains most of the narrative questions for the application. Uh, so these cover a couple of different questions on community conditions, uh, which include what are, the, what are the community investment needs? What are the conditions uh, relative to the community where this activity is gonna take place? Next, uh, we describe any public or private investment that has gone towards the revitalization of the community over the past five years. The next question asks how this project will align with local plans and public support. And we provide some referen reference links here to sustainable community action plans, reinvest Maryland and a better Maryland uh, 
to, to see where it may align with some of the goals, strategies, and, and uh, outcomes that those pursue. And also describe the public outreach, input, and support of the project. Next, what are the strategies that this project is going to use to uh, address those community needs? And then what are the outputs that you're looking to result from those strategies? So what are the measurements by which you're going to gauge whether they're working? And then what are the general outcomes? What's going to be the kind of qualitative outcome of the project? And how will the applicant collaborate with government, private, or public uh, organizations to achieve these outputs and outcomes? The next section is organizational capacity. So we ask, you know, what is the applicant's experience with administering similar projects in the past? Uh, what are the strengths? We ask during the past two years, two years only, has the applicant received any other awards from one or more funding programs of the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development? So these could be other SRP, uh, state revitalization programs like Community Legacy or CORE, but they could be other uh, funding programs as well, like community development block grants or uh, community investment tax credits. If you respond yes to that question, you'll be shown a table uh, where you can tell us, you know, what was the funding program? Uh, what year was the award made? What was the amount of the award? And what's the current balance on that award? The next section is administration. So we ask first, will the project be uh, solely administered by the applicant organization or will be it administered in part or in whole by an organization other than the applicant? So this could be a partner, a subrecipient, or something else. And if you say, yes, it's just, it's just us, uh, then all you need to do is just tell us who within your organization is going to be working on the project and, in, and managing the project rather. If you say no, that we are working with others, uh, then we ask you to identify all of the organizations that will be administering the project. So that could in, most likely include you, but also partner organizations or subrecipients. And then we ask you, uh, what's the, what type of organization is that? Uh, what's their relationship to you? And uh, what kind of activity will they be doing in the administration and management of the project. We also ask that you upload any kind of memorandum of understanding, MOU or letter or evidence of any formalized relationship with these partners that you've identified. And here again then is the table for putting individual names and contacts in here. So we say we're gonna be working with a partner organization and I from my applicant organization will be listed here as a project manager say, but then I've also got a guy named Grant Manager Jr. who's gonna be my accountant from the friendly CDC. And we ask then will the project use consultants, contractors, architects, or other contracted services? If you say yes, we give you another table here where you can provide the contractor consultant business name, uh, the role or the, and the service they'll be providing, and then identify if they are a minority owned or a women owned business. If the application includes capital funding, which as we've already said, most of them do with the exception of operating only Bernie's, uh, you will be asked if you have evidence of site control. And you could say, well, no, we haven't secured the evidence yet. But if you say, yes, we do have evidence. Well, actually, let me, let me step myself back there. If you say, no, we don't have it secured yet, 
we still have a narrative question here that you can reply and say what the status is, any problems you're having, uh, when you would expect to have it or if it would affect readiness. If you say, yes, we do have it, you can still give us a definition and a description of what site control you have. And moreover, if you say yes, you can attach that evidence. Here again, as was mentioned before, we've got a character limit on the page saves, or pardon me, a file size limit on the page saves. Uh, and with the, uh, with the upload fields, uh, we start with three, but as you add uploads, it will give you more. Then also with capital projects, as Melissa had spoken to earlier, uh, we ask if you have uh, Ms. Maryland Historical Trust review uh, determinations. And once again, you could say, no, uh, it's not been initiated yet for any known property. Um, in which case you can just kind of give a definition as to you know why it may not be required or may you think it might be required and it can be evaluated and taken from there uh, by our staff. Or you could say, yes, uh, indeed, we've already had a review initiated or secured. We have the determination and you can describe that here in the narrative box. And you can also provide attachments of that determination if you have it. The next page is community impact data. And this is sort of a statistical sheet of about 27 questions. Uh, answer them to the best of your ability as they would apply to your project. Uh, not every question would apply to every project, certainly. Uh, but where they are applicable, uh, please make an effort to uh, reply and provide a response based on the, the proposed project. Then finally, the attachments and authorization page. So this is the page where we're going to put all of our application specific uh, required documents. So Larry spoke to, to these items earlier, and that includes disclosure authorization, which is required of all applicants. We have here a link to the form. So you would click on that and it opens up a Word document. You would fill out that Word document, print it, sign it, scan it, and upload it back here into the system. Nonprofit organizations are required to submit a corporate resolution. Here again, we have a link to the form. So you can download the Word document, fill it out, print it, scan it, or print it, sign it, scan it, and upload it back into the system. As Larry mentioned, we do not require at the time of application local government resolution that will be pursued by the department on your behalf. But if you happen to have uh, other forms of local government authorization or letters of support, you may provide them in your application. We also have an optional upload field here for other form of signature authorization or delegation of signature authority. So if you have someone who's going to be signing documentation on your organization's behalf, who may not otherwise appear elsewhere in these documents, uh, you can provide that kind of uh, letter here. Next, we have the photographs. As Larry said, since we're still sort of all remote, uh, photographs are of high value, and we do require at least one photograph upload for the submission of the project. So uh, you can upload the one photo, and it will continue to give you rows on save if you would like to provide more. It's not visible because this is a Bernie application, but had I selected SDF core, there would be another requirement visible that would pop in right about here, which is the SDF core self-evaluation and scoring sheet. And similar to some of these 
disclosure and corporate resolution, what you would see here is an upload field with the SDF core self-evaluation heading. There will be a, there's, it's a link like this that will download for you the Excel template for that scoring sheet. So you would download the Excel template, fill it out, and upload it into the system as a supporting document for this application required only of SDF core applicants. And then finally, we ask as a requirement of nonprofits to provide temporary evidence of good standing. Larry also spoke to this. We have a link here directly to Business Express, the uh, Maryland eGov site, SDAT site. Uh, and you can go there, type in your organization name, uh, pull it up, uh, click on the details page, and then just do a print to PDF of that or a save as PDF of that screen and attach it here as evidence of good standing. Nonprofits then will also see these organization documents. So these are the same documents that are stored on the profile that we looked at earlier. So if you forgot about checking it then, before you got started, you can check it now. And uh, these links will open up the files that you have stored on that organization profile page you know, take a look at them, make sure they're up to date. And if you have to replace any of them or, you know, provide a new, a new year's worth of documentation for say charitable registration, which expires every about 13 months, um, then you can do so by leaving the application, going to my organization's organization uploads and replacing the file there. Once the file has been replaced, uh, this link will be current because it just points to whatever is currently stored on that profile page. After that, we have a space for you to provide other supporting documents. So anything else that's not a requirement but would support the application. So Larry mentioned things like cost estimates, like uh, program guidelines, uh, press releases, uh, publications, anything uh, that relates to the project uh, that would support the application can be put here. And once again, start with three upload fields, but as you add attachments, it'll keep adding rows for you. And then finally, you're just gonna provide your authorizing uh, signature name and title. Key point here, this green candy-like button is alluring to, to have you press it right away, but don't forget to press save. Once you type in your name, you gotta hit the save button for it to store it. So type in your name and your title, hit the save button, scroll back down, and then you're good to submit the application. Now I'm just gonna double check something here. Cause yeah, I wanna demonstrate. I'm gonna demonstrate uh, an error check. So when you save pages, if a required field hasn't yet been filled out, or if there's a math error, or if there's some other um, conditional uh, programmatic requirement uh, that's programmed into the application, if it hasn't been met, uh, you will see these page errors. And it's evident at the top in red text. And this is telling you that something has to be corrected before it can be submitted. Uh, so in this case, it's telling me that I didn't upload my required disclosure authorization. Now, if I went ahead and tried to submit this application with that error still present, I'm gonna get this screen that says, yep, see, there's a requirement that I have not met. So it gives me the link to go back to that page and sure enough, there's the error right at the top of the page. I make my attachments, hit the save button. And now I should be good to submit. That was the only error showing. So once again, the green button will take you here. 
this is a double confirmation. So we say we want to submit by clicking the green button. Now we're actually going to perform the submission and confirm the submission by clicking the status change here, the confirm button. When it goes through successfully, the page here will reload. And you can see that the status has changed. It was application in process. It now says application in review. And a system generated email will be sent to you telling you that the application has been received and that our program staff will begin to review it. Once an application has been submitted, you won't be able to edit it anymore, uh, but you can still view it. It will no longer be in your tasks window. We went from two down to one. Now I just have this other one yet. But after submitted, we can use the My Applications tab to, lo to locate it. and to reaccess it and review the pages or generate a print version or what have you if I forgot to do that. So I think that covers everything and I'm going to leave the screen share open for a minute and ask Olivia if we've received any Q&A in the chat. Yes, thanks Brian. And I, um, so there is, one or two questions out of, out of the chat, and I know, I believe one of our partners has also raised a hand. So where should I go first? First come, first serve. <laughs> okay. So uh, one question was, um, you had mentioned a word limit. Um, mm. Could you clarify what that word limit is? Yeah. I think in, yeah, go ahead. I, I do understand exactly, and and just to to specify, it's not word limit that the system uses; it's character limit. So a character is every letter typed, including spaces and punctuation. So when I said that um, the character limits of these narratives are two thousand characters, or four thousand characters. Uh, You'll always see at the bottom here where there is a character limit, it shows you um, what is the limit. In this case of the project name, it's limited to 100 characters, and it'll tell you how many characters you've typed in, so 29 of 100 in this case. Uh, again, with narratives, they're either 2,000 for short, uh, short response narratives and 4,000 for long response narratives, and that does equate to approximately one half page in Microsoft Word. Is, is two thousand? Pardon me. Two thousand characters is approximately one half page in Microsoft Word. Four thousand characters is approximately one full page in Microsoft Word. Um, so the follow up is one half page in Word, single or double spaced. It doesn't count the uh, the spacing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I see your point. Uh, I, I I believe it would be more like single spacing. Um, paragraph breaks breaks do not count really um in terms of characters uh so like a carriage return doesn't really count but um but in terms of individual characters yeah single spaced or double spaced i, I know it, it's sort of ballpark i know you could also say if it's you know 24 point font versus 8 point font um it, it's a ballpark estimate great um this next question Um, has to do, I, I don't know if it's, uh, it's a little bit specific to our system, um, but just overall in general, maybe with the application, are there any other new or changed questions besides the Bernie area question? No, everything else should be familiar from last year. Uh, the only structural difference from last year, uh, the Bernie question is new. But the only structural difference is that last year, we, we should have done this last year, but we, we broke out the individual requirement uploads, so corporate resolution, disclosure authorization. We gave them their own upload fields, whereas last year it was sort of all grouped together. Um, but, uh, but, but apart from that, there's, the Bernie question is the only new one. The Bernie area question, more, more accurately. Yes, thank you. 
that's all I see uh, specific to the system. I, I did also mention that I was going to say at the end of my presentation, uh, there has been question about, you know, our old, our old system and its compatibility with new web browsers. Uh, there is a contract in the works uh, to invest in and to develop the latest, greatest version of our online grants management system. Uh, that is in the works. Uh, we anticipate doing the entire system migration over the back half of this calendar year. Uh, so July through December, January. And uh, that includes uh, new servers and hardware equipment on our end. And so hopefully this will be the last year that we have to use this old system and we'll have something nice and shiny and new for you in the 23 round. If that is all, I'm going to pass it back to Larry. I'm going to pass it to Kyle. All right, fantastic. Uh, thank you, Brian, for the uh, great detail going into the uh, project portal and the submission process. Uh, we've got about two or three more slides left, and then we're going to close out with uh, any questions that Olivia did not get to answer why we were uh, in the midst of the presentation and all. And so she's been doing an outstanding job of staying on top of answering all of those questions. Okay, and so uh, as we were talking about our review process, uh, we mentioned all the team members that are part of the review process. And our criteria, this is how we scored the application. Uh, 20 points, up to 20 points for a demonstration of community need for reinvestment. Uh, 35 points uh, for clarity of the uh, project detail and readiness to proceed. As we said earlier, shovel ready projects are a priority for us and uh, clear detail of what the project is going to be, what's the outcome, what's the goal is definitely very important. Uh, the capacity of the sponsors and the partners uh, although that's 20 points as well, that's important. Uh, if you are a lead agency, if you are a local government or a community development, uh, and you have a other partners that are part of your um, application, you know what are their roles? Is that clearly um, laid out? And do they have the capacity to do said project or proposed project? And so that's very important as well. And looking at uh, committed other financial resources and leverage 25 points. Again, we talk about, you know, uh, we like to help you pay for the cake, but just not the whole cake. And so, uh, you know, as long as we see that there's other people that have or other entities that have slices, uh, we'd like to see that as part of your uh, budget as well. In terms of priority uh, considerations, you know, revitalization of older communities, uh, you know, helping them to absorb increased growth is very important and a priority for our funding for Project Core, again, an uh, initiative that eliminate blight and revitalize uh, communities in the city, uh, replacing the blight that's taken down with uh, new or affordable or market or a mix of affordable and market housing is very important. Uh, activities in designated main street areas of communities uh, in Baltimore City and around the state very important to us. Uh, Transit-oriented development, that's uh, promoting uh, redevelopment and connecting housing with job opportunities. It's definitely a priority for us. Uh, programs that encourage some environmental responsibility and stewardship, definitely important. Uh, programs that are utilizing or projects that are utilizing or in alignment with a full range of state and local revitalization programs and financing tools, as well as capital investments that lead to increased workforce development opportunities that may generate either temporary or permanent jobs. Thus, uh, projects like that are given priority as well. Now, our current awardees they are required, and I think this was mentioned earlier, to be in compliance with agreed upon project timelines. And so if you have received, if you are currently an awardee and 
you have an FY20 or an FY19 award, uh, we want to make sure that you are in compliance with your agreed upon project timeline. Uh, we'd love to see that at least half of the award is drawn by the first anniversary date of the award. The anniversary date is the execution date, the full execution date of the award. And so that's very important that, uh, again, it, it goes back to the uh, shovel readiness of the project. Uh, we know that uh, prospective uh, applicants that are not current with uh, requested reporting requirements, we ask that you really work with your project manager to make sure you get up to uh, date with your uh, reports. And until that point, we won't issue a new 2022 password to access, uh, to submit uh, a new application, but we're asking that you would uh, please get into compliance so we won't have any issues uh, if you are uh, not current with your uh, reporting. Uh, award types, just quickly, uh, we disperse our funds in two different types of ways, either through a grant agreement or loan funds. For large awards, that's when we usually uh, prefer to make it a loan. And so large awards involving new development or acquisition or rehabilitation that you know, we may require that future profits or a percentage of the award be repaid back to the department. And we usually secure those loans uh, by use of a promissory note, deed of trust, or some type of similar security agreement that's uh, developed by our attorney in concert with you and your legal representation as well. But those are only for very large projects. Your small $20,000 project, we would, of course, do as a grant agreement. Uh, we kind of already talked about the regions that people co uh, cover, and this is just a map. This would be in the presentation that we put online in terms of how we uh, map those regions. Region 5, which is your Western Maryland region, is covered by Sarah Jackson. Region 1 uh, is carried, uh, covered by Larry Brown. Region 2 by Trey Miller. Region 3 is Sarah Kim. Region 4 is Nick Mayer. Region 6 is Ashley Green. Uh, region 7 is uh, Yaffa Weiss, and I'll be covering Yaffa's um, region uh, while she is out or leave, and Region 8 is my region. Sure. Um, and these are contact information for each uh, project manager. I would suggest uh, emailing. We are still uh, teleworking, and so um, it's probably quicker to get a quicker response to uh, email. Uh, the person that's assigned to that region, and I'm sure they'll get back to you in a timely manner. And that's Larry and myself information. You can also contact us. For well, Larry, you can contact him for city-based information, and you can contact me for statewide-based information. All right, here's a great time that we've come to uh, questions and answers. And so uh, we'll jump into that and we'll open it up to Liv to let us know what questions we have. Sure. So I pulled some from the earlier chat just to bring to the whole group. But also, if you have any questions now, feel free to um, put them in the chat and then we'll address them um, on a first come, first serve basis. So just a couple announcements. The most popular question was, where is the presentation? And the answer is uh, we will be posting the presentation and also a recording of the webinar on our website, hopefully by the end of next week. Um, another question was when our applications due, and I think we mentioned this, but uh, June 24th at 3 p.m. is the application deadline. The next question is will there be EBBD? And that was um, enhancing Baltimore's business districts. And I did hear from Kevin that um, the fiscal year 22 round is still to be determined. However, I did mention that um, in the meantime, maybe apply to community legacy. But I did want to hear from the, um, the crew uh, what your recommendation would be for EBBD. Uh, yeah, I think to your point, Liv, um, they could possibly apply for um, community legacy 
or based on the area, we highly recommend a lot of, a lot of our partners to connect with some of our um, lead burning participants um, if it's located within a uh, burning designated area as well. So if you're uncertain, uh, please feel free to reach out to the project manager that's assigned to your, your area of your, your project or your program, and they can provide more details. But again, that's more sort of the broad and general answer without knowing the specifics and details. Yeah, but I, I disagree with Larry, so, you know, nothing else to add. Okay. Uh, the next question from the chat earlier, if you applied for fiscal year 21 seed and NED, um, will we know before the deadline? And also, um, you know, should we be applying for FY22 seed and NED? Yes, yeah, so um, we don't have the specifics of exactly what day um, the announcements will go out for the awards. Um, for, for, for NED and C for FY21 round. But we do anticipate those announcements to take place within the next week to week and a half. Um, so I would just say before you really begin to work on a new application for FY22, um, you know, just kind of give a week, week and a half um, to see if you were awarded um, to save yourself some time and some actual um, uh, unnecessary work. Great, thanks, Larry. The next question was specific to NED, but I think can apply everywhere for all programs. What should be our strategy for um, picking a program if your if your project is eligible under different uh, programs? So, for example, um, this particular person, if the project is within in, within a NED eligible area, should we? have a strategy to apply for one project in NED or one project in Community Legacy, or if we are eligible under NED, just to apply for both projects under NED? I'll, I'll answer that question. I would suggest um, applying for both projects under NED if for whatever reason we need to um, switch funding sources um, on the back end we could we can do that on our end but I would if you qualify uh, for a project in a net area I would suggest applying for um, both of those projects under net and I would just like to add that that's a great question um, that made me begin to think the importance of uh, just notifying everybody um, to only apply for one specific um funding source opposed to having the same project and applying for community legacy uh strategic demolition and so on and so forth if you apply that one project to one funding source we have the ability if need be to um assign it to a, a specific pot that might be best suited so don't spend a lot of time and energy um submitting one project for four different applications. Just submit one application, and if need be, uh, we have the ability to uh, best allocate the funding resources if your application is approved. Great. And I would say the only <laughs> exception maybe would be for the Bernie program, um, you know, with um, the lead organization would be applying for Bernie. Um, and I guess if you are within Baltimore and not, you know, sponsored under a Bernie lead organization, um, you know, you would only be eligible to apply for community legacy. But um, similar to what Larry was saying as well with, if you're eligible for both seed and SDF, I'm not seed, I'm sorry, um, community legacy and strategic demolition fund, um, it's, you know, you only need to apply to that project one time under one fund. Great, I'll move on to the next question, which is Larry's favorite topic. So it has to do with the, with the MOU. And the specific question was, is the MOU only required for for-profit developers or if a CDC is partnering with another nonprofit or a community association on the application, 
is the MOU still required? Yes, the, the answer is yes. Uh, we recommend to have MOUs um, to show the legal nexus between uh, the, the, the applied organization and any partner, whether it's a for-profit, non-profit, um, private, federal, any, any type of entity or relationship that you have, um, we got to show the partnership, the legal relationship um, through the MOU, so to speak. So, um, yes, please create MOUs to show the, 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 the relationship, um, especially if your, your partner um, is the one that has site control. And a follow-up question would be, does it need to be in the form of an MOU or is there any other kind of documentation that could qualify such as a letter of agreement, which probably is almost the same as an MOU, but are there any other types of documents that we will accept? Yes. So uh, again, um, any, any legal document that's pretty much signed um, by the two parties, uh, uh, some type of co uh, contractual agreement um, will be acceptable. So we often say memorandum of understanding because that's most common, but that's not the only um, type of agreement that we actually uh, approve. So again, and if you have specific questions, uh, we have great project managers that are willing and able to assist you and provide technical assistance um, if you're uncertain um, moving forward. Great, thanks Larry. The next question is, what is the best way to answer the site control question for program applications? such as a commercial facade improvement program, where property owners will apply to the program once it's available? Well, for uh, facade improvements, we do not have to show site control for facade improvement, uh, just as long as you have a, if it's a site, if it's a facade improvement program that's administered by the local government, you have an application process, you have a proof that this person is the property owner within your application process, that's enough. But for our legal uh, point of view, we do not have to provide, you do not have to provide site control for facade improvements. Great. The next question is, can projects that were submitted previously be resubmitted as long as they are updated? I would say yes, you could, uh, if it's a phased part of the project, one phase was finished, this is the next phase, as long as you're clearly delineating what the new use would be for those funds, then yes, definitely you can. And I also would just add too, um, it may, might be beneficial for you to reach out to your project manager, just to kind of get a sense of, you know, if there's a, a brief, a brief debriefing uh, about your application to see if it is any pointers or things that could possibly be changed to make your application a little bit more competitive. Again, um, as, as we mentioned a little earlier, for most of our SRP applications, it's pretty much four to one, four to one based on how many requests we actually get um, per how many dollars we actually have available. So it is in case some cases where a lot of good applications just can't get funded, so it's not necessarily anything wrong with the application itself, but we just don't have enough resources to fund everybody. But again, I think it will be beneficial uh, for that applicant that may want to reapply for the same project just to talk to your project manager prior to submitting um, to just kind of get uh, some feedback and a sense of what could be done differently to better position your, your project. Great, thanks. The next question is, are projects that focus on the revitalization of a single building or project prioritized over general community grants, such as a facade improvement program? Uh, no, uh, as Larry said, and we talked about, we just have a, we have a rating criteria that we use uh, when going through to score uh, projects. We uh, take recommendations from each group. We go through a several step process of reviewing and presenting those recommendations until we get to a final point of presentation to Secretary Hope uh, before a final approval. And so 
uh, it, we are supporting projects that support, that have impact in communities and that uh, are in alignment with the goals and focus of that community's revitalization plans. And projects that are shovel ready. So they, they're the projects that get most of the consideration. Projects that are shovel ready. Great. Thank you. So at this point, I think it's last call for questions. Also, if there was a question asked earlier that um, should be raised, you know, to the group level. Feel free to type any more in now. All right, well, I'll turn it back to you all in Baltimore. Fantastic. Thank you again for uh, participating in the training. Uh, I'd like to give a shout out again to Olivia, Melissa, Brian, uh, Larry, and uh, Ashley, and also the entire uh, neighborhood revitalization team. Uh, we are available. If you have questions or concerns, like I said, please reach out to your region uh, representative. Uh, we will be posting this on uh, the DACP website soon. Uh, and if we get an opportunity, we will try to also send out the link to those who are uh, pre-registered as well. So just be on the lookout for that. We look forward to uh, seeing your uh, application and we wish you the best. And hopefully we'll see something submitted by uh, the due date of June 24th. Have a great week and talk with you soon. Thanks, guys.